uh, grateful uh, to uh, of you being here today. Um, Armand Hauser, I, when I saw your biography on Wikipedia, it was uh, amazing and huge. <laughs> it's difficult to synthesize uh, <laughs> your it's... personality just with few words. I can say you, you got a PhD in physics, then you, you have been an entrepreneur and uh, I think uh, one of the most amazing uh, endeavor was Econ Computer. You also work uh, with uh, Olivetti in the Olivetti Research Laboratory. And then all the uh, career about uh, also being a venture capitalist. Uh, so I think uh, this uh, night we will talk uh, about all this stuff. But uh, first of all, I would like you to introduce yourself and uh, um, explain your um, extraordinary career, but also give us uh, um, some uh, insight about the future and the perception that you have uh, from your position and your work. Thank you very much, Herman. Well, not at all. It's a great pleasure to talk to you. As uh, you mentioned, I spent uh, three wonderful years uh, with Olivetti in Ivrea and all over the world in the end. Uh, with a wonderful uh, vice chairman that it had, El Serino Piol and Ulza Carlo de Medinetti. Uh, but it was three of the best years of my life. So if I uh, can just try and share my screen for my um, talk, uh, and let's see if that uh, works. Um, so... Um, Rino Corizza, okay. <laughs> right. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Wonderful. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, my talk here is really one, I mean, and you mentioned it uh, very well already, uh, that we're at a, at a stage in the development of mankind where evolution is gradually being replaced by design. So my <clears throat> talk really is about deep tech in Europe. And uh, these are the main points of my talk. I start off with making a, a quick characterization of where the US, the EU and China are, then why the concept of technology sovereignty uh, is such an important concept. And in many ways has replaced uh, geographic or military sovereignty uh, with uh, uh, technology because the dependence that technology uh, can produce between states is now equally severe as military dependence in the past. Then I'll touch on four key technologies, which in my opinion uh, will uh, change our lives within the next uh, five to 10 years, uh, not, not 30 years, but five to 10 years. And they are quantum computing, AI machine learning, synthetic biology, uh, and the blockchain and smart contracts. And last but not least, um, as I'm the vice chairman of uh, the European Innovation Council, I say a few words on the EIC, the European Innovation Council, because we've set it up to solve some of the problems I um, <clears throat> will describe earlier on in my presentation. So here is a, a quick characterization of where the US, China and Europe are. The US, of course, completely dominated by big tech like Google, Facebook, Netflix, Amazon. And we know them all. Uh, we have a love-hate relationship with them. And they have become monopolies. Uh, some of them are now more powerful uh, than states. And we've got to do, and fortunately, I think America is waking up to this as well. We've got to do something about it. China, of course, is the great rising star that uh, a very few people are... Uh, except, especially the Americans do not accept that China has overtaken uh, the US in 2017. People always look for China to overtake American GDP in nominal terms, but in PPP terms, in purchasing power parity, China has already overtaken uh, the US in 2017. China now has a, a PPP GDP of $22 trillion, uh, Europe, interestingly, is number two uh, with about uh, 20, and uh, the US is number three in the world. Of course, people in the US don't uh, accept that. Now, Europe has this big decision to make 
on whether it wants to be the Europe uh, of this picture that I've shown here of the Colosseum that all of you know, or whether we want to be uh, the Europe of science parks. This is our NAP laboratory uh, here in Cambridge. Now, this is the characteristic uh, slide that best uh, sums up uh, America at the moment, where eight of the largest companies in the world are by market cap uh, are American. This slide characterizes China, this phenomenal rise uh, just over the last uh, 20 years. Uh, you know, uh, in, in the year 2000, China was smaller than Britain, a, a minnow, a, a small uh, country uh, in GDP terms. And now it is the largest uh, GDP in the world on uh, PPP terms. Now, uh, when it comes to Europe, <clears throat> Uh, there's this uh, very sad situation that we're in, that if you ask, although we're the second largest bloc, uh, including Britain for a moment, uh, uh, you know, because although despite Brexit, Britain is part of Europe and always will be part of Europe, uh, uh, you know, Britain has this delusionary period that it goes through that it can go alone, but it can't uh, anywhere, as we'll show later on. So although we're number two in the world after China, if you ask people, who is the world's leading economic power? 42% say the US, 32% say China, and 9% say the EU. So there has never been an entity in the world that has punched so far below its weight uh, than Europe. You know, we, we have a real perception problem in the world. So, which leads me into the uh, point on uh, technology sovereignty. The um, pandemic, uh, in 2020 has given Europe two major wake up calls. Uh, first is that, that we realized how dependent we were on Chinese manufacture. I mean, it was most obvious in the availability of masks and personal protection equipment, but uh, it made it clear that this uh, is just one small sector of the economy where it has become very apparent that we're very dependent on China. But once people realize that, they realize that there, is, there are many aspects of our supply chain uh, where we are dependent on China. And of course, uh, the uh, Italian fashion industry uh, can tell a, a story or two about that too. The second big wake up call that we have received during that period was the Trump uh, President Trump, or ex-president, uh, fortunately, ex-president Trump, has weaponized U.S. technology and used it to coerce European companies to do their bidding. Uh, it was a particularly uh, difficult uh, realization for Great Britain and other European countries that this uh, relationship that we've had with the U.S., where uh, US was always deemed to be a reliable partner in, in, our, in the development uh, of the world. And all of a sudden, this very long-standing reliable um, relationship with the US has been put into question. So these economic dependencies uh, lead to economic coercion, which are just as effective as uh, military coercion. I've written a paper that I'm very happy to share with you, uh, and you can distribute it to, your, uh, to the audience if you want to after this lecture on technology sovereignty, where I give the following example. Uh, there is a guy called Eugene Black III, who is uh, the uh, Vice Admiral of the Sixth Fleet. Uh, the Sixth Fleet is the American fleet that is uh, <clears throat> Uh, dominating the Atlantic. If uh, Eugene Black went into 10 Downing Street in, and talked to the British Prime Minister uh, and said, uh, uh, you know, I want, uh, I am keen for you to do the following. Uh, and he would point at the aircraft carrier, the American aircraft carrier that he's put up in the Thames estuary uh, and uh, force the British Prime Minister to do whatever he wants them to do. There, of course, would be a total outcry in Britain of this interpretation of the special relationship. Uh, 
This would not be acceptable behavior. But when Mike Pompeo struts into 10 Downing Street and tells uh, Boris Johnson uh, that he can't use Huawei uh, in, in his uh, um, mobile phone wireless infrastructure, just after GCHQ, which is the, uh, the British um, uh, security services, and GCHQ uh, is probably one of the most highly regarded se uh, security organizations in the world. And GCHQ cleared Huawei for non-essential parts in the, in the British network. But Mike Pompeo, because of the US, de de the dependence that Britain has on, on US technology, uh, managed to force the British Prime Minister to change his policy on Huawei. Now, I have no issue uh, with the policy on Huawei, as long as it's decided in 10 Downing Street and not in the White House. So the fact that a European country is being forced to do things by the White House against the uh, recommendation of its own security services just shows how effective that economic coercion can be. And this is a problem for all of Europe. Uh, it was just particularly blatant in, in the case of um, Huawei and UK, and it concerned Arm, which is a company, uh, which is the microprocessor company that uh, I started uh, uh, many years ago. Arm originally stood for the Acorn Risk Machine because it's a microprocessor that we produced um, at Acorn. So in a way, technology sovereignty has become one of the iconic problems of Europe going forward. And we've got to establish uh, our own independence uh, in, over the next few years, because we've got to ask, every nation now has to ask itself three questions to avoid this uh, one-sided economic dependence. The first question is, do we have the, te the critical technologies uh, the critical technology that is necessary for our own economy, but also for our, for our governments to work uh, properly. Do we have these technologies ourselves? In which case, uh, if it's a European technology, we've got access to 5G, for example. 5G is one of those critical technologies, of course. We've got Ericsson and Nokia uh, in Europe, so we're okay there. When it comes to semiconductors, for example, uh, there are now only two companies in the world, uh, Samsung and TSMC in Taiwan, that can produce five nanometer chips because Intel has uh, stumbled. So uh, we've got to make sure that we bring this semiconductor technology to Europe as well. And fortunately, Europe has decided to have a 145 billion euro uh, semiconductor initiative to give us independence on this critical technology in semiconductors. So if the answer to the first question is no, we've got to ask the second question, which is if uh, no to the first one, do we have access to this technology from multiple independent countries? So that a single country can't force uh, us to do uh, what they want us to do by withholding this technology from us. And if the answer to that question is no as well, then we've got to ask the third question. Do we have unfettered, long-term, more than five years, guaranteed access to this technology from a monopoly or oligopoly supplier from a single country, typically China or the US? And if the answer to all three questions is no, <clears throat> then we must do whatever it takes to use Draghi's terms, uh, to ensure a yes to at least one of the three questions. And if we do not do this, then we can de become dependent on another state and exposed to economic coercion, which, as I pointed out, is just as severe and as serious as military coercion of yesteryear. So now I'll talk a little bit about four key technologies, four key innovations that in my opinion uh, are going to change our lives within the next five to 10 years. And they are quantum computing, artificial intelligence and machine learning, synthetic biology, blockchain and smart contracts. 
So let us start with uh, uh, quantum computing. Uh, quantum computing uh, as a physicist, of course, is, is, is a wonderful uh, new development that I'm super excited about. Uh, and um, I've made uh, quite a number of investments in this space already. Uh, the main difference uh, between a quantum computer and a classical computer is that classical computer work on bits. They're zeros or ones, so they just have two states. And then a quantum computer, you have qubits, quantum bits. And these qubits uh, have this peculiar uh, property that they're not zero or one, but they're a little bit of zero and a little bit of one. So they are probabilistic mixture between zeros and ones. And that superposition between zero and one is the fundamental reason why quantum computers have this exponential performance improvement uh, with the number of qubits uh, in, in the computer. The consequences of this uh, are quite uh, exciting and serious. Uh, one serious aspect is the code cracking. Uh, the, the main encryption codes in, in the world that are widely used are the RSA codes. And RSA codes depend on factoring very large numbers. But factoring very large numbers uh, is susceptible to Shor's algorithm, which is a quantum computing algorithm that is exponentially faster than the classical algorithms. The reason why we think at the moment that RSA codes are secure is that we do not know of any classical uh, cracking algorithm that can crack these RSA codes in less than uh, 100,000 years. So people are comfortable with 100,000 years. The problem with quantum computers is that it will be able to crack these codes in just a few hours or days. So people now have to think, and if this is happening in five to 10 years, which I believe to be the case, then uh, anything that people encrypt at the moment with RSA codes, which is the majority of the encryption of all the industrial inscription that we have, then people should be aware that, uh, that potentially in five years time, uh, this can be read. The second application, which is in, in my mind, the most uh, exciting and positive application is molecular modeling. As you probably know, the main problem in drug discovery is to discover a small molecule which binds into a protein and changes the um, effectiveness of that protein. If it's a bad protein, uh, it might, by, by having a small molecule like a drug molecule, it might stop uh, this protein doing the bad things that it uh, uh, that it may do. Uh, this is one of the biggest problems in healthcare, of course. And <clears throat> if uh, quantum computers are as good at molecular modeling, and these molecules, of course, are quantum uh, entities, uh, and as Richard Feynman fam famously said, if you have a quantum system, why would you want to model it? Why would you want to simulate it with a classical computer? The natural way of simulating a quantum system like a molecule is, of course, with a quantum computer. So the long-term vision that has many people very excited is that you can do drug trials in silicon, uh, in silico. And this is one of the hardest things to do, as you, I'm sure, are aware these drug developments can take eight to 10 years. Uh, and if you can do these drug trials in a computer, of course, this would speed up things enormously. Europe actually does have uh, a lead in many ways in this, uh, in this field because our universities uh, uh, are leading, have leading groups um, all across Europe, including Innsbruck. I'm delighted to tell you, of course, I'm originally um, Austrian. I was born in Vienna, but I actually grew up in the Tyrol and Innsbruck is the, the capital of the Tyrol. And I understand uh, quite a popular uh, destination for Italians as well. We, uh, we, we love Italians in, in Innsbruck. The US and China are outspending us at a spectacular, um, by a spectacular amount. And uh, in this context, I would just uh, like to 
uh, tell you the story of IMQ. IMQ is a start. We've got lots of startups in quantum computing in Europe, uh, <clears throat> uh, but IMQ has just managed to raise 650 million as a startup using a SPAC. So the SPAC, these are special purpose acquisition um, uh, companies. Uh, they're all the rage in Wall Street at the moment. And they're a, a new funding uh, scheme uh, that has, been, has become very popular in Wall Street, uh, raising about 100 billion this year already. So if you look at our European initiatives and the the firepower, the, 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 the monetary firepower that we can bring to bear on issues like quantum computing. Although we have um, you know, a 1 billion euro quantum computing flagship pro, uh, program for all of Europe, uh, there is a 2 billion program in Germany, a 2 billion program in France, uh, a billion program in the UK. This, uh, you know, here you've got a single company uh, in in America, raising almost a, a billion uh, to do this. So there is real competition there also in in the way we fund uh, these technology companies. China uh, is spending as much, if not more, uh, money uh, on this, and a lot of it is government money. And a good example is Wei Pan. Wei Pan did his uh, PhD in Innsbruck, actually, he's uh, Chinese. He went back to China and has become Mr. Quantum Computing. But as opposed to the European teams that might be, uh, you know, tens of people, maybe a hundred people, uh, Wei Pan has 1,000 people working for him in China. So China is out and the US are outspending Europe and we must uh, up our game to do this. Uh, because we've got to design these quantum systems in order to make the progress in, in healthcare and other areas that we need. In AI, uh, we do have a, an interesting European play with Graphcore, which is a, a company that uh, we've invested in at uh, Amadeus Capital Partners. Uh, Graphcore is uh, the highest performance AI processor in the world at the moment. It is uh, higher performance than NVIDIA. Uh, so we do have uh, uh, we do have at least on the processor side uh, a, a good play, but a lot of the progress in AI and machine learning, of course, depends on big data, and big data is owned by GAFA, by Google, Amazon, Facebook, uh, Apple, and so on. And uh, because of uh, GDPR in Europe, I'm, I'm very pleased with this uh, European development because one of our strengths in Europe is to is to write the rules and, and make reasonable suggestions as to the standards. And uh, the GDPR standard, I think, has become a, a standard that is copied uh, all over the world. And it basically says that people should own their own data and the data shouldn't be owned by Google or any of these American monopolies. And they then make uh, money with our own data, which is in, in many ways uh, very uh, disturbing. Uh, we have thought a lot about um, the, legitimate, the legitimate use of data. You know, when, uh, when should we able, should, should a society be able to use the data of other people? And the best uh, principle that we've come up with is that you've got to look at the purpose of what the data is being used for. If you take health for an example, clearly it is very valuable for us to have anonymized data of all our patients in our countries so that we can deduce uh, the uh, origin of particular diseases and make uh, progress with that. So to sum up this AI and machine learning uh, story, which clearly is already spectacularly successful. I mean, AI does work uh, and it works very, very well. And we will soon have autonomous cars uh, which will reduce the number of um, accidents on roads. And there are lots of examples uh, where, where AI can improve the way we organize our society. But the big danger uh, that uh, has appeared mainly with GAFA is that we have allowed American companies to become monopolies. 
and they need to be broken up. I see no alternative to breaking up Google, Facebook, and Amazon. It will be very difficult for Europe to break them up, but fortunately, there is a lot of awareness, even in the United States, that these companies, the, the big tech companies, have become too big and too powerful. On the plus side, uh, AI and machine learning align, allows us to design systems that are a lot more complex than any of the systems uh, that we've managed to design uh, before. In particular, we're making good progress uh, in understanding the most complex system uh, there is in the world at the moment, which is, uh, of course, our own bodies. Which brings me on to synthetic biology. Uh, synthetic biology, the reason why I've called it synthetic biology is because it is so fundamental. It's basically the uh, the fundamental building blocks of, of life. I've been very fortunate to uh, have been one of the uh, investors uh, and promoters of uh, Solexa, which is uh, the gene sequencing company that we produced in Cambridge, uh, which was sold to Illumina. And now 90% of the gene sequencing in the world is done on our machines. The same team uh, I've now um, used again to uh, some of the same team uh, to start a new company in Cambridge called Evonetics, which does gene synthesis. So not reading the DNA, but writing the DNA. And there is a, a lovely book by Max Tegmark, the professor at MIT, who wrote a book called Life 3.0. And Life 3.0, uh, he called it Life 3.0 because Life 1.0 is the nematode worm, the little round worm, where both the hardware of the worm, but also the behavior of the worm is completely determined by evolution. Life 2.0 is us, where the hardware is still totally determined by evolution, but the software, our behavior, our culture, our language, of course, is taught by us, uh, taught to us by our parents and our uh, society around us. And Life 3.0, he argues, is when we finally take control of our hardware, of our biology as well, not just uh, our culture, uh, which of course is very exciting, uh, but also very dangerous. So uh, this book uh, writes about all these uh, issues. Uh, synthetic biology uh, will herald a revolution in chemistry because a lot of the chemical uh, processes in particular, of course, the harbor process of nitrogen fixing uh, is done in very harsh conditions, high temperatures, high acidity, and nature, of course, using enzymes and biology can do it all in fermentation, which is done at normal temperature, at room temperature, and uh, proceeds in a much more uh, CO2-friendly uh, way. But it needs very level-headed he uh, regulation, uh, like the Embryonic Research Council that uh, was started in the UK, which really is a very good example on how you handle these very uh, sensitive moral and ethical issues uh, because synthetic biology basically means that you can design life and design biology uh, both for good and for bad uh, reasons to come. Which brings me to uh, the last of the four technologies that I believe to be uh, the, the key technologies that will really change our lives within the next five to 10 years, and it's the blockchain and smart contracts. Uh, it's sometimes also called distributed ledger technology because uh, you don't have a single a point of failure, but the, uh, the whole blockchain is distributed through, uh, throughout uh, a network of um, uh, computers, uh, often all around the world. Now, Bitcoin and ICOs, these initial coin offerers have a terrible reputation because there's a lot of fraud. I mean, 80% of the ICOs are, are, are fraudulent and they have tainted the technology, but that shouldn't distract from the fact that the mathematical underpinning of the blockchain and smart contracts is very found and allows us to decide to automate business processes so they can be very, very helpful for society. So the two things that need to happen is that we need to automate a KYC and AML, so know your customer and anti-money laundering. Once we've automated that, then there's a lot of activity with lots of companies are trying to do that. Then I think we will be able to hit uh, uh, 
uh, this will hit big time and become a great, um, a great success. The, the first examples of where this really might change our lives is in global payment systems. So um, a, a, a blockchain, um, uh, in particular, central bank digital currencies, and this is again something where, where Europe is uh, lagging behind and China is leading at the moment. China has uh, introduced the Yihuan in four major cities, Shenzhen, uh, Beijing, Shanghai, I think. So. Uh, it's an instant payment system uh, which uh, will replace cash and uh, make all transactions uh, much more efficient than in the past. So it's, it's a big revolution that is certainly going to happen within the next five to 10 years. All the central banks uh, in the world are working on this uh, and Europe just needs to speed up its, uh, its process in that. It will also have an impact on real estate because you can have, it's very easy to have part, partial ownership and insurance. But good regulation is needed. And again, uh, the good regulation part is something where Europe can, can lead. So let me finish uh, with a few words on the European Innovation Council. I uh, chaired the <clears throat> advisory board that wrote the basic rules for the European Innovation Council and I'm now vice chair for the rollout. It's a $10 billion deep tech fund for Europe. It's by far the largest deep tech uh, fund uh, in Europe. Uh, and it is trying to address the issue that the US has five times more venture capital in Europe. And China has even more government money to spend uh, for, for, for deep tech. It is divided into two main um, sections the EIC Pathfinder, which is 4 billion euros for grants, and then the EIC Accelerator, which is 6 billion euro, euros in equity and blended finance. And what we mean by blended finance is that it is both a grant and equity in the company. It is particularly exciting that Europe has decided to make direct investments in deep tech companies in equity. This is very important to solve the, the lack of venture capital in Europe. And the way we've written the rules so as not to crowd out the venture capital market, but quite the opposite to crowd it in, is that uh, the EIC will only make an investment in the company if more than 50% of the equity money comes from the market. We also have a very close relationship with our sister organization, uh, the European Research Council, which is a 20 billion euro uh, initiative part of Horizon Europe, both the ERC and the EIC are part of Horizon Europe, which is the next a big um, R&D funding program for the next seven years from 2021 to 2027. It's about 100 billion euros. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it will start uh, this year. So in order to uh, wrap up my talk, uh, I uh, started by telling you the big problem we have with technology sovereignty in Europe. It is also clear that no European nation is large enough to be technologically sovereign themselves. The only entity in Europe that can be technologically sovereign is actually all of Europe. Now, this is something that uh, uh, I've made very clear to the UK government as well, uh, <clears throat> because despite Brexit, Britain will have to do it together with Europe if it, if it wants to have this technology sovereignty. Then I uh, told you a little bit about the four key technologies that I believe will change our lives within the next five to 10 years. Uh, and then I said a few words about the European Innovation Council, uh, which is 10 billion for deep tech uh, in Europe. It is also very important to mention as, uh, as my last point that the role of government is really to provide the right regulation uh, to, and, and be a catalyst to support uh, technology in Europe. So I'll stop here and I'd be very happy uh, to answer uh, any questions uh, that you have. Well, thank you very much. It was uh, extremely clear, extremely scientific, but also a bit worrying. 
you <laughs> a lot of um, your slide were really scary to me because uh, when you talked about economic coercion it's something that um, i think uh, our politician have uh, not clear i would like to start my question from this point uh, why in uh, your opinion uh, the european politician are not uh, sufficiently worried about what china in the US are doing in technology? Uh, I think they are waking up uh, because they realize, uh, and, and, and in a way, the pandemic was that wake up call, both with respect to China, but equally uh, importantly with respect to the US. The US is so preoccupied with its trade war with China that if Europe stands in the way, they will walk all over Europe. They will not care about the, uh, you know, the traditional, as we've shown, uh, as we've seen with Trump. I mean, Trump even questioned the usefulness of NATO. So, uh, you know, we relied on, uh, we, we just assumed uh, that um, the US was a reliable partner that uh, will be a, a reliable partner forever. Well, Trump, uh, Trump might have been an outlier, but uh, you know, I don't think things are going to change all that much with Biden. The fascination in, in the U.S. is with China. And uh, if Europe stands in the way, they'll, they'll do their own thing. So we've got to do our own thing. We've got to become independent of China, but we also have to become independent of the U.S. And we're big enough to do it. We've got the money. We've got the brains. Uh, we, we lack the self-confidence a bit. And, and, the, and the most important bit that we lack is our ability to take big risks. Uh, you know, we, we need to, uh, this is not a, a game where we put, uh, you know, tens of millions here and there or even a hundred million. This is, uh, this is an issue of investing billions and, and maybe a hundred billion. Uh, in my article that I will, I will send you, I, I'm calling for a hundred billion uh, fund uh, in Europe 50 billion to become independent from uh, China and 50 billion to become more independent from the US. Yeah, so um, do you think there, there is a, a cultural issue? And um, we, we are trying to sympathize in this, in the, um, in the US, they'll always say, uh, fail big, fail fast. In Europe, yeah. we aren't able to say that. And sometimes, you can have trouble all your life with uh, banks, uh, with financial institutions, if you had uh, one failure. And uh, why is that uh, in, in Europe? It, it's something um, cultural, it's something uh, uh, connected to our laws that are different from um, the US. Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> we, we're just timid. Uh, and the reason why we're timid is uh, we, uh, and I see in the chat quite, quite rightly this, uh, uh, this question about the European federal government. Uh, we do have, there, there are more and more things that we will have to do as Europe rather than a nation state. Uh, because um, say that the hundred, and, and we are doing some of it, uh, you know, we, we are going to spend 145 billion on creating our own semiconductor capability. So there is at least one case uh, where Europe is doing it. And there's no way that even Germany, which is the largest economy in Europe, has any chance of spending 145 billion. It has to be all of Europe. So, so uh, you know, people have under, understand that now. Uh, it is just that semiconductors in many ways is, is still very much the exception of where Europe is rising to the, uh, to the challenge. Uh, but we've got to do it uh, across the board because there are many other technologies and many other issues where we've got to take these bold steps and put the money behind it. And we can because we're rich. You know, Europe yeah. is a very rich uh, area and we are clever. We've got, uh, you know, our universities are very good. Uh, we have just, we just in the past, at least, we were not willing to, uh, to risk uh, the... Uh, uh, to risk putting enough money and enough resources behind uh, the problems that need, need, need solving. Um, do you think that uh, there is uh, also a problem uh, of uh, competition in Europe? Uh, like uh, 
there are a lot of different uh, cities that are trying to attract capital, attract startup. For example, there is London, there is Berlin, there is Paris. Uh, uh, Milan is too small, but is trying to, um, but also Madrid. Uh, if you think about the United States, there is the Silicon Valley that is still the most uh, powerful uh, uh, um, ecosystem concerning startup. If you think about China, you don't have democracy. You have uh, um, a very strict ruler that decide and have the ability to foresight um, and plan consequently. Uh, so um, do you think that we need to choose on which country, uh, on which um, city to invest in Europe and also uh, uh, to lower our chauvinism and nationalism that is still uh, live in Europe? Uh, well, if you look at Silicon Valley, although Silicon Valley, of course, is still the number one a high tech center uh, in the US, it's uh, Silicon Valley mainly on the ICT side, uh, but you've got the Boston area in the life science side, uh, you've got the research triangle, you've got New York. Uh, so there are quite a few areas in um, uh, the US that have become deep tech centers that, that produce uh, excellent um, uh, uh, companies in the various fields. The same thing is true for China. And in Europe, we also have a number of um, uh, centers. I mean, we do have, uh, uh, of course, London and Cambridge in, in the UK, which I know very well because that's where I've lived uh, some of the best uh, years of my life. Uh, we've got uh, Munich, Berlin, Paris. Milan is also uh, coming along. Uh, Italy is a bit behind there, but there is uh, there just has to be more um, support for the local big companies, uh, the big, the, sorry, the, the, the big cities in each of the countries to build up their own high technology parks and high, high technology uh, centers so that, uh, uh, you, you know, this can be done on a Europe, uh, European basis. There are a lot of questions coming on the chat. Uh, I don't no, if you want to choose uh, one or two. Yes, uh, there is the, uh, uh, maybe I'll just uh, take the one on pick uh, on picking winners uh, because picking winners uh, is, is, is a very um, emotive uh, story and everybody uh, always quotes it as uh, the last thing that you want to do is to let government pick winners. And uh, this of course is true. It's been shown in the past that if you've got national champions uh, that are chosen by government to be the, the suppliers of choice. Uh, you get uh, a reduction in competition, you get uh, corruption, you get all these, all these bad things that happen with picking winners. So what the EIC is trying to do, uh, and that's why we insisted on the crowding in formula, is uh, that uh, the EIC money uh, that goes into these deep uh, tech companies has to ensure that most of the money has to come from the market, which means that it, it enforces the discipline of the venture capital industry. If the EIC cannot convince uh, the, uh, the, the hard-nosed venture capitalists that do their due diligence uh, uh, you know, to invest in the company, then it is not allowed to do it. So that's why I think the bad aspects of picking a winner are addressed by making sure that there is competition for it, proper market competition. Because the one, uh, the one uh, property of a capitalist system that has been shown to be very effective and work very well is competition. The minute you've got a fair level playing field, a capitalist society works brilliantly. It squeezes out all the profits from, from all the different areas by a lot of competition. And that is the reason why America is failing at the moment with its big tech com com companies, because the way America um, elects its senators, elects its houses of representatives is through this lobbying system. And in order to become a, a senator in the United States, you need to raise a hundred million dollars. Uh, in order to become president in the United States, you need to raise a billion. Now, where's that billion or the hundred million going to come from? Is that going to come from the Uber drivers who, uh, you know, pay $10 to the 
Republican or Democrat uh, party? Of course not. It's coming from the big companies. Now, the big companies are not going to give uh, Donald Trump uh, or, or Biden or uh, the Republican senators a, a, you know, tens of millions without asking anything in return. And the thing that, they've, that has happened, and there's a wonderful book called um, uh, the, uh, the Great Reversal uh, by um, Thomas Philippon, who is a French professor at MIT. And he noticed that this lobbying system has created an atmosphere in the political system in America that does not object to um, mergers and acquisitions anymore. So their telecom system, for example, and their aircraft system has had so many mergers that now there is an oligopoly in, in the telephone system with a few, a very few uh, suppliers like Verizon and Sprint making incredibly high profits and producing a very bad service. Whereas in Europe, the opposite has happened. We've got very good competition laws. We now have lower uh, telecoms charges in in Europe. If you uh, you know if you uh, get your internet connection, you pay a lot less in Europe than in the U.S. And the same thing is true for for the airlines. That the U.S. who were leading in telecoms and and low cost airlines have given that lead to Europe, uh, who is now leading in telecoms and airline because of uh, the competition aspects. Um, I have some more question about. Uh... Um, our trouble in competition with US and China. Like, for example, uh, do you think that we have uh, a shortage of uh, STEM uh, professional in Europe? Well, uh, it's not as bad as in the US. Uh, uh, so two things to be said is Europe does not have a startup problem. We actually produce more startups than the US. We've got a scale up problem. So the big problem is to put the packages together for 50 to $100 million or even a billion dollars now investments in early stage companies that might not even have any revenue yet, like IMQ. You know, IMQ just got $650 million for quantum computers. They don't have any revenue, but America is willing to put uh, enough money behind these companies and becomes a bit of a self-fulfilling um, prophecy. So that's, uh, you know, that's a very important aspect uh, that we've got to, uh, look after uh, our scale-ups. Yeah, you, you touched something that I know directly because I am a startup, -er. so <laughs> I know exactly that uh, in Europe and mostly in Italy, nobody give you anything if you don't have attraction. Everybody's asking me attraction. And I think that in, in some field like quantum computing, but also in uh, machine learning, it's very difficult to have attraction. Um, for example, we are working in the fintech uh, field and uh, we are experiencing uh, these two main issues. The first issue is that uh, a lot of our customers have a very long selling cycle and big regulatory constraint, very, very important. And the second one is that uh, it's difficult to have uh, data. And so it's very difficult to uh, create uh, good algorithm in machine learning if you don't have data. And uh, I can say that there is also a um, problem from the regulator, regulatory part. For example, I was working before for a Bank of Italy and um, I, I tried to ask uh, for um, some data to, to have a machine learning, uh, also suggesting that we can use, uh, like for example, synthetic data to anonymize uh, the data and uh, at the same time, um, use and uh, create our algorithm. Um, I, I, I don't know, um, is only a problem about uh, regulation, is a problem about uh, people unwilling to take responsibility or something that is so sensitive because uh, sometimes I feel people is scared of uh, taking responsibility. Yeah. For example, yeah. in health data, in financial data, they don't want to risk anything. Uh, yes, yes. Well, there is a very good question that I just uh, uh, read about um, 
uh, Europe being very good at uh, regulating business, but uh, not so good at boosting it, which is uh, certainly true. Now, regulations are important, and GDPR, I think, is a, is a wonderful case of uh, regulating uh, Google and Facebook uh, a little bit, but uh, that, uh, that is sort of um, trying to, uh, uh, to deal with the, with the problem uh, once the horse has bolted. So we, we must make sure that in the next um, a generation of new technologies like the four that I have mentioned, uh, we don't have a repeat of the Google um, story because we had perfectly good um, search algorithms in Europe we just didn't manage to uh, promote them and, and support them uh, the way the, uh, the Americans did and make a business out of it uh, through, uh, through advertising. So what we need to ensure uh, in quantum computing and, and, and synthetic biology and all these others is that we find uh, we create the big companies uh, in Europe uh, as well. Um, one more question about uh, blockchain. You mentioned blockchain and also you mentioned KYC, AML. And so maybe you also know the self-sovereign identity uh, framework. Um, I think it could be um, a good opportunity for Europe uh, to develop its own uh, data um, agency and also data startups. Um, I heard that uh, the European Commission is working uh, on a new EDAS, uh, that is the um, directive uh, about uh, um, digital identity, trusted uh, parties, and so on. And they maybe would like to introduce the self-sovereign identity. Do you think that uh, self-sovereign identity will help uh, the European uh, startup uh, world to, uh, to grow, to be more relevant? Yes, I do. Uh, I, I do. I think all these, uh, you know, people, uh, there's some sort of cultural um, objection to, uh, to these things. Uh, but you, you just have to think through the uh, productivity increases, the improvements that you can make in the way we organize our society uh, with these new techniques. And uh, uh, of course, you know, we've got to have the regulation, we've got to I think through the ethics, etc. But uh, that's not the only thing uh, that we need to do. Sometimes I feel in Europe, we're so preoccupied uh, with the ethics and the moral aspects and the regulation, right. which, is, which is important, but that's not the only thing that is important. It is also important to actually get things done and, uh, you know, and, 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 and build this capability. Uh, and we must, be, we must uh, become a player in these, uh, in these new games. Yeah, you, you, you absolutely uh, touched my point because uh, um, I was uh, willing to ask you something about uh, the perception that Europe has about herself. Um, I, I believe that uh, we are looking for a zero risk society. And so we are uh, all the time uh, a lot more interested in ethics, in uh, regulation, and uh, scared by taking some risk that uh, in China yes. are taking all the time. Uh, is that something connected uh, with uh, our democracy or is something connected with our history as Europe was leading uh, for a, a lot of time of our history? It's just the 21st century that is the Asian century probably. That has changed. Uh, yes, and, and of course China has exactly the opposite uh, is in the opposite situation. They're so enamored with their phenomenal growth. Uh, you know, they're so excited that they're finally coming out of this 200 years uh, hi hiatus because they've always been a great nation. And for some reason, they, yeah. they missed the last 200 years. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they are gaining in self-confidence all the time uh, because they see every year that things are getting better, a bit like in Europe after the Second World War, when we also had this wonderful period of great economic growth, etc. And, and we're a little bit stuck in a, in a low growth phase. And uh, we, we sort of um, have, have lost some of our mojo. Uh, but I, I'm pleased to say uh, the next generation, our young generation, I, I think, uh, of people, uh, of Europeans is, is more, uh, more, more positive. And I think we just have to listen to the young people more and let them let them do what they want to do rather than being all 
uh, old uh, fatty daddies. I think uh, we couldn't uh, finish better than this. Your, your uh, message is really full of hope. And uh, uh, so I think uh, first, of all, first thing uh, you really awaken with your message, but also this hope, uh, it's really um, important. And also the fact that you talk uh, about being more self, uh, uh, more self-esteem about our ability to, to be competitive, to be clever. Uh, I, I cannot be more grateful to you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Herman Hauser. Thank you. Uh, well, wonderful. thank you very much. It was a great pleasure. Uh, as you know, I have a real soft spot for Italy. So it was uh, delightful when I, when I got this invitation. I was very pleased I could uh, talk to you about that. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.